Good morning and welcome to Global Perspectives. From our home studios, I'm David Dumkey. And I'm Katie Coronado. Welcome. Today, from Cairo, we are joined by Habak Azman, the founder of Belkarama, an organization which works with a variety of grassroots women's groups across North Africa and the Middle East. Welcome, Habak. Thank you. Great to be with you. Taking on women's issues in this region is, is obviously a challenge. How did you get, in, get into this field? I guess I stumbled on it, you know? It's um, being a woman, of course, you are always interested, in, you know, all the issues that affect you as a woman. And at certain level, you then want to help support other people. So, you know, it's um, nobody tells you when you are born that you will be working on this, but I hate injustice and injustice against women. And, uh, you know, because the woman in any culture, in any country, are faced with a tremendous amount of problems and uh, they are always trying to survive and to, to do something about it. So people like me are facilitators, making sure their voices are amplified and heard and, you know, there are resources for them and, you know, there's uh, research to make the case to support them against violence, uh, you know, or support uh, political participation so the laws will change and, you know, one thing leads to the other. So, yeah, I think um, if you ask any woman, how did you get into this? They would tell you it's her story. It's every woman's story. You know, there's no one point that you say, well, this is the moment I got involved or, you know, it's uh, and if anybody claims that because they want to help a woman, uh, that's not it. But facilitating and, you know, um, and, and, and because you can, you have the luxury and the privilege to be in a position to, um, to support that and facilitate. I think I was very lucky, yeah. Habak, and I appreciate what you said about women knowing that they must do this. And when it comes to a personal perspective, can you share with us a feeling that you remember that may have triggered that moment when you decided to do what you say that we should do as women, that you can go back to, that you can think of, that can align with your work today? I wish I could tell you this was the moment, uh, to be honest, but um, I guess I, um, I was one of those people who was not told to leave the you know, table or to wait for the boys to eat. So I was lucky in that sense, but I had a sense of agitation and anger uh, because no, there was no equal, even in the same family, you know, there are some that are more equal than others when it comes to boys. Uh, not necessarily in my own story, but in other stories where the boys were sent to school, where the girls were forced to marry at a very young age, where they were not allowed to get out of the house or get a job and all this. I mean, that absolutely was something that really, really made me very, very angry. And um, I was very lucky because my family was not necessarily, they certainly believed in, you know, getting married at a very young age. I mean, my grandmother always reminded me that she got married at the age of nine and my you know, sister or mother, you know, at the age of 10 or you know, my sister at the age of, you know, 14. And, you know, so, um, so uh, and, and, and I think something people don't understand is nobody says, nobody explains to my mother or my grandmother that this is, you know, this is not the right thing to do because she's doing how, she's basically following the footsteps of her, you know, a, a mother and her mother's mother and the culture and the religion and this and that, it's just something very normal. So when the young girls, actually, the men have something else in mind because the idea is get when they are young and mold them the way that you want them. And they always go after young girls who did not open their eyes here, who did not go to school. So when the modern age came and girls were going to be sent to school, the last thing a man wanted was, uh, you know, uh, to send them to school. So I could see some, you know, girls who were not sent, sent to school and, at a young age, you don't really understand that. You just, you don't even understand maybe the family, you don't analyze it. It's just the way it is. So uh, yeah, I mean, and of course at, the, uh, at an older age, for example, at this age, when I see women who are not being appointed to important positions, it pisses me off. And uh, of course you have to really get, uh, you know, the, uh, the exposure and the education and support for them to have their own, you know, constituency. And, you know, at certain levels, you come to understand something and then something comes more important. Well, at a very young age, it was girls should be to, uh, you know, go to school. There should not be any female genital mutilation was wrong. 
uh, you know, logomy was absolutely wrong, misinterpretation of the culture and using it, uh, you know, as a religion, justifying it by religion was wrong. So you come to understand, you know, uh, um, what can be done. But I was just, I was never afraid to stand for what I believe in, even at a very young age. You mentioned that there uh, was feeling of anger, and I wanted to touch on how you were able to convert that, or or were you able to take that and channel that into using it to something positive, in your opinion? You know, anger, maybe, um, you know, it's um, a lack of better word, but of course, consent, and because, you know, um, I, 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 honor, I believe that everyone was equal from start. So I never really understood there was men and women and they were not equal. And coming from a culture that really, you know, emphasizes that, you know, a man is here and a woman is down somewhere here. Of course, that's, uh, you know, and continuously being confronted with what my belief was and what, uh, you know, what the culture was, of course, you know, it was uh, very difficult to reconcile that. So, uh, and then again, coming from Somalia and, you know, and, and also, you know, trying to do living in the States and, you know, in other places, it was very important for me that uh, when my country was falling apart, there really weren't many people who were helping and supporting women coming from conflict areas. So, I, you know, I remember going to the Congress and, you know, doing debriefing and starting uh, you know, organization for, uh, you know, for lobbying for African issues. And then from there, starting another organization called Center of uh, Strategic Initiatives. What I understood was it was extremely important to work within a network to build a constituency. Of course, you learn by mistakes, you know, because if you go and say, I'm going to do a briefing for the Congress, or I'm going to do a briefing for the constituency, or, or I'm going to go and talk to my own community, you know, you have to understand there are other people who speak the language of the community. Just because you come from that community doesn't mean they would, uh, you know, understand. So a couple of things. Number one, building a constituency around me was very important. I understood because I was agitated. There was war going in my country. I was agitated because uh, women were not equal with, uh, you know, with men. Uh, agitated because there were a lot of obstacles of things I could do or others could have done, but they couldn't because of their gender. Um, and uh, and I think uh, what happens at war is women find themselves in a you know in a position where they can make decisions because nobody's going to tell you don't talk to the Congress don't go to the media don't talk to the religious leaders in your community because everything just you know the men pick up the guns and they left and I was very lucky to be in a you know in a in a, in a place where others helped me supported me and I understood multi, I was very multicultural. So I was not someone who was trying to fight from a village, but I understood the power of village. So the thing that made, I think, difference was, I understood it was extremely important to be connected, whether you are in New York, Washington, Geneva, if you are going to speak, you know, your own constituency, you need to look like them, talk like them, you know, use their terminology and put that in a way that the community understands because they trust you because you're speaking you know, in a way that they understand you are speaking, they trust you and they tell you their concerns, but you have to package that in a way that the decisions that are affecting them in New York, Washington and Geneva or Paris or whatever it is, are, are absolutely have the right information. And within that to connect with also more people like me who can then make that influence. So, it, it, you know, I, I understood the connection between here. So, I never really left my community. And this is what, where Karama comes in also, because that's exactly Karama. What we are doing at Karama is we are connecting, uh, you know, the dots. One, we are making sure and listening with the women on the ground, what are their needs. And I, I learned that, you know, uh, at, at the personal level, because I wouldn't have been able to do anything if I didn't understand what was needed. I wouldn't be agitated. If I didn't know that uh, so much was missing and it, and it didn't have to be that way, because I don't think you just become angry about something, but it's when you know things don't have to be the way they are, when you have to believe that things could change. So if in Somalia girls were not going to school, the school had to be created. It's not about money. It's not anything. It's convincing the community. If you need to convince the community, you need to talk 
to them. They have to, you know, respect you. You have to be somebody at that level that they respect that you can talk and convince them to send girls to school, to stop, for example, the female genital mutilation. And it's not just me, but finding those women who have been working on that and then supporting them and amplifying their voice at the regional and international level so then they can make an influence so they can get the resources they need. So it's, just, I think just, you know, uh, what is it? This is, uh, I think being a woman is very complicated actually because you have so many roles and so many things and, you know, you depend on some and, you know, others depend on you and all that. But uh, it, it, to me, it was always a story. You know, uh, you will meet women who understood early on that they have to change the law because you just can't say women's rights for the sake of, and sometimes it's really, when people talk about the, all the incidents in the world, it's, uh, it's ridiculous, it doesn't make sense. You have to understand what's possible, you know, and then take that into, you know, what the reality is on the ground and sort of, you know, mold it to the point where, okay, everyone sees it, yeah, you know, a woman running for office is okay. It's not against my culture or religion because this is what their priority. This is what they have put. And this is what people don't understand. It's like, uh, you know, you know, they think cultures are really bad and they concentrate on the bad things. Every culture is very difficult, whether it's the US or whether it's, uh, you know, in Africa or in the Middle East, you just have to understand because at the end of the day, whatever you are trying to do is something that has to affect the people. And if it's going to affect the people, it better be something that they have prioritized, that they can relate to. Your personal experience, Abak, um, being you know born in Somalia, seeing your country uh, literally fall apart, <clears throat> you've also worked uh, since then in, in other countries that have gone through turmoil. It's 10 years since the Arab Spring, quote unquote, occurred. Um, there are some who would say maybe conflict and when there's instability isn't the time to talk about women's rights. What would you say to that? That's the best time to talk to because <laughs> things are so going chaos. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you look, for example, at the, at the Arab Spring or Arab Nightmare, you know, many people, of course, refer to, to different, uh, you know, uh, words. But the fact of the matter is women were at the forefront of the revolutions. Their voices were louder than anyone. They consistently and persistently were at the Tahrir Square, David, as you know, or to you know all the squares. They uh, they brought their children. They brought the food. They you know they they encouraged the men to stay on. And I think the revolutions would have been a total disaster if the women were not there. But what happened? I mean, they completely lost that fear. And you have to you know in countries that were more conservative than others, like Egypt, for example. You know, they lost that fear. Something just that wall of fear was gone. But then what happened, the minute the, the, minute the transition, that the revolution becomes successful and the transition takes place, then the women are pushed back. All of a sudden, you know, the Islamists came and women should not do this and women were being raped or women were being harassed in the middle of the, you know, Tahrir Square and other places. And, um, and it was really the families were then afraid for their children, for the, uh, for the girls and said, you know, stay in. And then the girls, of course, went behind the board and were, you know, the ones who still were calling people to come out. And then when the transition takes place, they are pushed back. So, um, but something has happened. Women would never be the same after these revolutions. They are still working on the law. They are still trying, you know, they have absolutely pushed, for example, as you know, in Egypt, uh, the constitution that was drafted had uh, 18, uh, you know, laws that protect women and women's rights. And that was great, but the question is then when the parliament is elected and if the, people, the right women are not elected, no one's going to implement that. But the point is they are up to today, they are working and making sure that these laws are implemented and enforced. That's one. Um, so in Tunis, it's the same you know, way. So women are absolutely still at it. The revolution hasn't finished as far as women are concerned. So, um, so, so, that were, you know, it's um, they didn't go back to the to, to the kitchens yet. They're still, you know, working together. They have absolutely sorted out their differences in terms of let's concentrate on these laws to be passed. They are more um, they are working more together than they ever did before in their history. 
So coming together on unified issues when it comes to the women's rights. Of course, there's a long way to go, but that's uh, that's that. It, Somalia is very different. Somalia is very conservative. Uh, the you know the civil war, of course, was uh, devastating. Uh, the women were not given their right place. And, you know, they, uh, after today, you know, um, you know, they have 30%. And this is, this is the mistake that people make. Um, when they say, for example, we need 30 women, you know, maybe the government will take 20 women and appoint, her, appoint them. They will not take women, they will take women who are safe for them because one is, uh, and I think we have seen that in the States or in Europe or anywhere, if the woman, if they don't come from the woman's movement and they're just woman, somebody's wife or somebody's, you know, relative or, you know, someone who has been in the party and, um, you know, they are appointed, they just will keep the party line. They, because they are, it's, they are not woman's woman. Let's just put it this way. You know, they're not a woman's woman. They're, they're women who are uh, basically, um, you know, have the party line and who are protecting that party. They're, they're, uh, Loyalty is not with women. And I think that's a major problem because now if you look at the UN, for example, we are always, you know, pushing for women to be, for example, in all this um, peace, um, what do you call, um, you know, agreement, peace uh, agreements and the peace processes. And, you know, there, there's a whole resolution, 1325, that says women should be involved in the peace agreements through, and the peace processes throughout the peace process. And we're still, after 20 years, the, the, there has to be national action plans. We're still fighting for it. Because then the government turns around and the militia or the opposition turns around and says, of course, we have four women in the meeting. But those women are not women as women. Those women are women who are appointed by the government, who are loyal to the government, or to the militia who are, you know, or opposition who are loyal to them. So there is, uh, and it's not just, you know, Somalia, it's not in any country. I think it's everywhere. Everywhere, because if you look at all the envoys for Syria or Libya or anywhere, they're all men in suits most of the time. So the United Nations cannot even implement their own, you know, resolutions. Uh, Europeans, you know, the same thing. If you look at any given uh, meeting, you will only see maybe one woman and the rest are men. You know, so for us, it's not the question is not, you know, we, we have a long way to go. We have to change the law. We have to change. You know, we have to build, uh, you know, strong constituencies, you know, across nations and nationalities to support each other, to make sure that more women are there. Yeah. Hibak, is there a relationship between the women who are there as what I would say are potential placeholders in these positions, in government positions, and fear? Uh, what would it take to get rid of that scenario and and have women who represent women's rights in those positions in the future? We have to have very strong women's organizations and women's movements that will push a woman's agenda. And we have to make sure, even for example, let's say in the States, for example, anywhere, women who are running uh, and who have a woman's agenda should be supported. And I think women need to realize their own power, that they actually actually power is by numbers that you know when you are real for countries that are lucky that can actually elect and have elections and democracy uh, there is no reason why they shouldn't have a woman who has a woman's agenda but some women are afraid of women who have a woman's agenda you know they really are scared so uh, and of course there are some for example if you look at the in 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 some countries you know it's actually the political parties that need that, that actually have to give a list of women to run. And the political parties, of course, will give the list of women they will give are not necessarily a woman is woman. They will give safe women who are more loyal to the party than they are to the issues. So we have to find a way and fight and organize to make sure that those women who are who are going there, you know, are, are, have a woman's agenda. But uh, even if they don't have where they go in, there's no reason why they shouldn't be really, you know, pressured to support womanist issues. So if you want to get away from tokenism that you're, you're, you're talking about, um, but I know you don't like using the word empowerment. Why, why is that? Because it doesn't make sense. Nobody can empower you. Nobody, 
See, women are strong to begin with. They're the ones who are bringing uh, nine months they have a child in, in their stomach, you know, and they are strong. They are the foundation of the society. If you really want to look at the society uh, and, and, and predict where that society is going, you have to look how they are treating their women. As any society who's leaving their women behind by not supporting, but they don't have laws that support the women. They are not giving them positions that can make a difference for the society. They are basically want to keep them, you know, in their uh, homes. That society is not going to go anywhere. And if you look at all the countries that are going, you know, crazy more than others, or are falling apart, are really a lot of times, and I'm sure this is going to be controversial, but you'll find out that those countries are a lot of countries that did not really, and I'm not saying that it's, that's why all the chaos is happening, but they did not, they ignored 50% of their society and left them behind. You know, they didn't educate them. They did not, uh, you know, support them. Um, a, a lot of times, uh, it was funny because I was talking to a, a, a parliamentarian friend of mine in Egypt, and we we're talking about women's rights. And she said, uh, she was in parliament and she said, you know, I brought up what about the women's rights, this and some, you know, guy stood up and said, that's, a, that is, a, that's, a, what do you call this? Um, that's sectarism. That's not, you know, the woman's issue is like a religion, you know? So he said, no, no, we shouldn't be talking about that. So that's the point. We have to really be this, but tokenism and woman empowerment, it, it, it disempowers you. What does that even mean? You are powerful. You are there. You are the teacher. You are the mother. You are the one who's bringing all these children and, you know, and everybody else in the house. You are the foundation. So nobody can really say, I'm going to empower a foundation. Foundation is what holds the society. So women are front and center. So when you tell them we are going to empower the woman, you're actually dispowering them. What you need is you have to find their strength and support that strength so that they can live a better life because it will change the economy. It will change. It will actually, they say, you know, when women are involved in peace agreements, 15% of the time it works. And then you have only 2% of the women who ever signed this peace agreement. So, yeah, women are absolutely, you know, um, and I'm not just saying it because it's the right thing to say, but, you know, it's a smart thing to, to do, really, because I don't understand, you know, why women should be left behind or why they are always after thought. You know, it, just, it doesn't but, make sense. And as women, we need to think that way. We cannot think of waiting for someone to liberate us from ourselves. It doesn't work that way. You have to bring something to the table, you know. And Hibak, if those women are having uh, self-esteem issues, they're in domestic violence situations, you know, there are cultural issues involved too, what advice do you give these women who, they need to find that strength that you're talking about? What do you use to help them see and find that within them? Because that's hard sometimes. It is hard. I was in South Africa once. And I want to visit a shelter and it never, I, I st up to now I'm having nightmares about it. There was this woman with three kids and her husband was looking for her. And if he found where she was, he, he was going to kill her and kill the children and everyone. And I'm talking to the woman and, you know, one eye she's uh, trying, you know, she's keeping her son and helping him to do homework. The other eye, you know, the younger child wants to run outside to play, and she's, she has the other eye on this. Uh, the, the other one, she's watching the one, you know, that's, you know, feeding another one. So no matter where they are, uh, women are always taking their responsibility for the family and for themselves. So supporting them and helping them so they can get out that fear. A, you have to come up with strong laws that does not allow for a man to touch or beat a woman. You have to keep those, you know, uh, violent men or criminals away from them by law, uh, seriously, because a lot of times we hear nightmares where the woman called the police and the, po uh, the police does not, you know, take her seriously. Or in our cultures, the family or the tribe gets involved and then they say, you know, you know and puts that family to and then in a week or a few days, the woman, you know, gets killed. So number one, you need to, the law, um, and number two, you have, don't keep them in shelters. How many shelters are we going to open up for women? That shelter issue should be temporarily. And then you have to find the resources to make sure that she's not homeless, that her children are going to school, 
that is the way to support. Supporting is not just to show women who have been beaten up and their pictures and they're raising money for them. That's not what it is. You have to support her, uh, sending her children to school, go back to school, making sure that economically that she can afford the house and she can, you know, uh, find a job and, you know, I'm preparing her and those who are not educated, uh, you know, training them for a job and, you know, guaranteeing them, you know, for a job. This is what it is. We, this whole idea of shelter is very good, but it, is, it has to be temporarily. The law, uh, the police, you know, the politicians, it needs a whole nation to work to make sure that woman is supported. We're running low on time. So very briefly, how do you define success? Being safe. Being Excellent. Safe. And, that, and going out and just saying, ah, oh, no one is going to come and kill me. <laughs> yeah, being safe and secure and, you know, and, um, and, and, and making sure that you don't get, uh, you know, that you can actually imagine tomorrow, a better tomorrow. Well, Habaka Azman, it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Um, you're doing some fantastic, fantastic and very important work. And uh, we commend you and look forward to talking to you again uh, in the future. Thank you. It has been a pleasure. Thank you very much, David. Let's talk soon. And thank you. We'll see you next week on another episode of Global Perspectives.